It is late afternoon, September the 29th, 1957, Chelyabinsk district in the southern Ural Mountains, the Soviet Union. Residents notice an unusual yet spectacular display of colors in the sky, ranging from deep blue to violet. Local press will interpret this as a strange case of the northern lights appearing much farther south than usual. But the mesmerizing colors carry a threat of death issued by the nearby facility known as Mayach or Kasli. They are the early visible signs of the first large-scale nuclear accident to happen in history. Welcome to Kishtim, a crisis outstripped only by Chernobyl and Fukushima in terms of severity, and a catastrophe whose causes and consequences were hidden from nearly everyone for decades. The Mark facility was located in Kishtim, a Russian town within the Chelyabinsk Oblast on the eastern side of the southern Ural Mountains. Today we're talking about it as the epicenter of a disaster, but even without such catastrophic events, Kishtim would be a noteworthy topic. During the Cold War, this nuclear site was under the surveillance of the CIA for decades, and while its purpose was not initially clear, it later emerged that Mayak and nearby facilities were the birthplace of the Soviet nuclear program. Initial work on the site was conducted from 1945 to 1948. As was usual for the USSR in that period, the bulk of the work was conducted by forced labor. Up to 70,000 inmates were transported from 12 labor camps of the infamous Gulag system. These were camps where criminals, dissidents, and perceived enemies of the regime could be locked up for life, providing slave labor to the state-owned industries. The Kishtim workforce thus included political prisoners, standard criminals, and prisoners of war. In the spring of 1948, the entire local population, as well as the convicted labor force, were of evacuated in a mass relocation. The laborers presumably returned to their gulags, but the details around how the Soviet authorities displaced the original inhabitants of the Kishtim area are unclear. We can only assume that they were relocated to protect the secrecy of the operations at the nuclear plant. After the eviction was concluded, a new wave of settlers arrived, described by a CIA report as communists and their dependents who came to Kishtim from all over the USSR. They were reportedly never to leave the area again. We can interpret this statement to mean that the new settlers were Soviet loyalists and their families or co-workers. They may have been assigned to work on a program so secret that they would not be allowed to ever leave again. Most of the work at Kishtim was conducted around a restricted area of 2,700 square kilometers, encompassing eight small lakes connected by narrow waterways. Thanks to high-altitude air recon, the CIA was able to gather that the main atomic reactor was placed in a tunnel dug beneath one of these watercourses. Only a smokestack was visible above the ground. A CIA source described an interesting detail of the construction. The laborers had completely drained one of the eight lakes and built a structure on its dry bed. The building was made of cement, rubber, and lead. Then the lake was refilled with water and the area was connected to the outer perimeter via a double-track railroad. Now, I'm not an expert on the engineering best practices of a nuclear reactor, but this underwater structure sounds like it was meant to contain or process hazardous nuclear waste with the lead and the water itself both likely intended as insulating layers against the radiation. This appeared to be consistent with the official purpose of the Kishtim plant. According to reports and communiques issued by by the Soviet government, the plant was designed to process nuclear waste produced by other reactors in the country. However, the CIA source collected information that contradicted the USSR's official party line. The Kishtim plant did not just process waste from other facilities, but could boast its own atomic piles and nuclear reactor. The site was involved in the production of radioactive material intended for the Radiological Institute in nearby Sungul, which sounds like a medical institution. Right? Well, according to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, the Sungul Institute was actually the chief design lab for the Soviet nuclear program. The US equivalents would have been the Los Alamos laboratories. Moreover, Kishtim was reported as manufacturing components for atomic weapons. More proof of this can be gleaned by the amount of personnel involved in the plant, which gives an idea of its importance. As of 1956, the CIA reported that Kishtim and nearby Azersk were home to military personnel from various army units, including a SAM battery. The number of troops is not specified, but consider this. After construction was over, the plant was heavily staffed with about 41,000 forced laborers. Such a mass of prisoners requires at least one guard per 10 inmates, which should work in shifts of at least three per day, so that's 12,000 troops. 
Plus, the CIA agent reports that the area around Kishtim was not protected by fences or barbed wire, but the lack of structures was more than compensated by a heavy presence of armed guards maintaining a tight security perimeter and restricted movement of personnel. So, we have the guards for the prisoners, the security personnel, add to that the logistics and signal units, and I'm going to guess the Kishtim was garrisoned with at least 15,000 troops. That's three army brigades or one division. Could a simple waste disposal facility justify the presence of an entire army division? The composition of the labor force also deserves some attention. It consisted of 16,000 regular prisoners, plus 25,000 Russian Liberation Army soldiers, formerly under General Vlasov. Back in June 1942, Red Army Lieutenant General Andrei Vlasov had been captured by the Germans at the Siege of Leningrad. After a short period in captivity, he had decided to defect to the Axis, as he considered himself a Russian patriot, but was opposed to the Soviet government. In December, he obtained permission to form a collaborationist force known as the Russian Liberation Army to fight against the Red Army. Vlasov's army first saw action in December 1944, and at its peak, the group numbered 200,000 troops. As the Red Army rolled the Axis back into Central Europe, the Russian Liberation Army made an escape to Western Europe to surrender to the Western Allies, but the majority of them were handed back to the Soviets. They duly punished Vlasov's men by executing them or deporting them to a gulag. General Vlasov himself was hanged on August 1, 1946. So, ten years later, a large force of the former Russian Liberation Army was still employed as essentially disposable slaves exposed to high levels of radiation. After the Mayak plant and Sungul laboratory, had produced the first Soviet nuclear bomb, the government demanded more. This led to shortened production timelines and the disregard of safety measures. As a result, 17,245 workers received radiation overdoses between 1948 and 1958. Moreover, the dumping of radioactive waste into nearby rivers from 1949 to 1952 caused several breakouts of radiation sickness in villages downstream. Residents of the area were thus familiar with the invisible dangers coming from the Kishtim site, but were they prepared for the disaster to come? It is now time to get to the day of the disaster, September 29, 1957. According to 1991 reports from the International Nuclear Information System, or INIS, the accident originated at a plutonium separation plant. The cause was the failure of inadequate cooling systems in a tank used to dispose of highly radioactive waste. The cooling feature ignited dry nitrate and acetate salts, which in turn caused an explosion of the waste material. The explosion dispersed nuclear fission products over an area area 300 kilometers long and 66 kilometers wide, home to about 270,000 people. The overall radioactivity of the debris had been estimated by INIS at 20 million curies. I feel now is a good time to clarify units of measurement for radioactivity, as there are a lot of them. Curies measure the amount of radioactivity up with the unit used by the INIS in its report. Currently, the most used unit of radioactivity is the Becquerel. 20 million curies are equivalent to 740 peta Becquerels. That number, 740 Pater Becquerels, is a 74 followed by 16 zeros. A healthy human body has an activity of just 8,000 Becquerels. And you can keep your calculators in your desk because we've crunched the math for you. That's more than 90 trillion times the healthy limit. So, what is the impact of 20 million curies or 740 Pater Becquerels? Well, this is actually measured with another set of units, one of them being the sievert. This includes the the amount of radiation deposited on human tissue. A 1994 study by doctors Akliev and Lyubchansky estimated that 1,054 inhabitants of the closest villages were hit with a radiation dose of 570 millisieverts, directly affecting their bone marrow. For context, people are normally allowed to be exposed to radiation levels of 2 or 3 millisieverts every year. These people received 200 times that. And just consider that exposure to 350 millisieverts was the criterion for relocating people after the Chernobyl accident. The INIS report also specified that more than 90% of the radioactive material dispersed by the explosion consisted of cerium and zirconium isotopes, which did not cause much worry. These are categorized as short-lived radionucleotides decaying within five years. But 2.7% of the waste consisted of strontium-90. That's a very different story. This small amount of strontium-90 caused a decades-long radiological hazard in the area, affecting bodies of water, small animals, crops, and working its way up the food chain 
to humans. At its peak, the radiation caused by strontium was 4,000 curies per square kilometer, that is approximately 18 billion times more than the average human body activity. This isotope became responsible for persistent high levels of dangerous radiation in the so-called Eastern Urals radioactive trail. Following the accident, the Mayak plants were surrounded by frenzied government activity. Containment and evacuation efforts were underway. It was clear to all residents that this was not a case of northern lights showing up way down south. Within 10 days of the explosion, more than a thousand inhabitants had again been relocated away from the extreme evacuation zone. A further 10,000 would be evacuated in staggered stages over a period of almost two years, peasants were ordered to slaughter their livestock and bury their crops. Depending on sources, between 20 and 32 towns and villages were evacuated in the aftermath. The Soviet government under First Secretary Nikita Khrushchev desperately wanted to try and keep the accident a secret. It was not good PR to publicize such a disaster at the heart of the Soviet nuclear program. Most of what happens in and around Kishtim during that autumn remains shrouded in secrecy, or to misuse a Winston Churchill quote, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Nonetheless, an unspecified CIA source managed to collect some testimonies about the event, writing a short but chilling report of the immediate aftermath. The report, number CS3-389785, was distributed on March 4, 1959, more than one year after the event. The agent tells how all the food stores in Kishtim had been closed after the explosion as a precaution against radiation exposure. New supplies had to be brought in by train and truck. The food was distributed directly from the vehicles, with long queues rapidly forming, reminiscent of rationing during World War II. The people of Kishtim received news from the nearby town of kamensk Uralskiv. Civilians had started to fall to an unknown mysterious disease, which was most likely radiation sickness. Witness accounts spoke of severely diseased people whose skin was literally falling off. It was later estimated that 200 inhabitants died of cancer caused by radiation, although a definitive death toll is difficult to confirm. As the incidence of the sickness grew with time, so did the fear of the population, described by the report as growing hysterical. A few leading citizens were spotted wearing small radiation count as a clear sign of privilege, as these were not commonly available to the general population. This top brass must have felt safer against radiation sickness, but it may not have spared them from other types of trouble. The agent makes a note of how this state of things aroused public anger. The agent's report includes testimonies collected from two Soviet emigres, one in England and the other in Israel. They reported that the nuclear accident had caused a vast nothingness resembling a lunar landscape around Kishtim, where no vegetation nor wildlife could grow or exist. Shortly after the disaster had occurred, authorities moved in for the cleanup operations. As it was often the case in the USSR, this dangerous job was assigned to inmates of the Gulag system. <laughs> Surprise, surprise! According to another declassified CIA memo, prisoners were offered shorter sentences or even pardons in exchange for their work at Kishtim. But Gulag authorities clearly did not expect these prisoners to survive until their release, as they called their teams death squads or death brigades. One year after the accident, the doomsday landscape had not improved much. According to a CIA report dated the 16th of February 1961, people around the area affected were still avoiding the local bodies of water. Food produced locally was taken for inspection to the district capital of Chelyabinsk, 100 kilometers southeast of Kishtim. People traveling to Kishtim were detained at the local train station, carefully inspected, and allowed to enter the town only if they had a special permit. And many of the contaminated villages had been burned to the ground to prevent resettlement. Its inhabitants had been forcibly relocated with little more than the clothes on their back. The CIA memos did not have much of an impact outside of the intelligence community, and the CIA was actually responsible for this. While the agency did not hide their findings, they also avoided any effort to make the disaster widely known to the public. It seems counterintuitive. Why not highlight the fact that the Soviet nuclear facilities were marred by poor safety measures? But the aim of the CIA was to protect the image of the nuclear industry as a whole, and especially to avoid the public questioning the safety of the Hanford nuclear site in Washington state. By 1959, in fact, Hanford had been expanded with the new N reactor. This was the only dual purpose facility in the United States used to both produce plutonium for atomic weapons and to generate electricity. The disaster became better known to the general public in 1976 thanks to Soviet dissident biologist Zohorez Medvedev. Medvedev was able to give some details on how the medical situation was 
was handled following the disaster. Apparently, the Soviet government took the treatment of injured and contaminated citizens very seriously. The Deputy Minister of Health of the USSR, Professor A. I. Berznayan, was dispatched to assemble specialized medical teams in nearby Chelyabinsk and Sverdlovsk. He was helped by Professor G. D. Bysonolov, an expert in radiology and radiation sickness. The medical aspects of the disaster, however, including incidents of radiation disease and death toll, were classified. Professor Bysonolov was able to write a report describing 11 cases of radiation sickness, but it was never published. From his part, as a consequence of his experience, Professor Berznayan later strongly opposed the location of nuclear power stations near inhabited centers. Medvedev also estimated that Soviet academia had published more than 150 studies of the effects of the long-term contamination in Kishkim on both crops and the environment, as well as the impacts on the genetics of plants and animals. These studies had zero visibility in the West. Even in the USSR, they had scarce impact. The problem is that they never acknowledged that the high radiation levels in the eastern Urals radioactive trail was linked to an accident. From 1971 onwards, the construction of nuclear power stations became a priority for the Soviet energy program, and again, academia downplayed the risk of disasters and the possible negative impact on the environment. An article by N. V. Kulikov, published in 1981 in the journal Ecologia, presented a complete absence of contamination in the soil or waters near nuclear stations. According to Kulikov, it was common practice to produce food supplies very close to Soviet nuclear power stations. The warm water from the cooling systems flowed into ponds used to raise schools of fish. The heat emanating from the reactors was trapped into greenhouses. These stations were surrounded by buffer areas or health protective zones 2.5 kilometers in radius. However, these areas were used as pastures for cattle, for allotments, and even recreation parks because that sounds safe. In general, the Medvedev reports showed how anything that could be learned from the Kishtim disaster was widely ignored in the ensuing decades, resulting in the mistakes which later led to the disaster at Chernobyl. Medvedev's analysis and disclosures were obviously concerned with the events of September 1957. However, the Kishtim plant was at the center of other contamination-related events. Much of the waste from the nuclear reactor had accumulated on the bottom of Lake Karache, some 30 kilometers west of Kishtim. From April the 10th to May the 15th, 1967, the dried-out, contaminated sediments from the lake were dispersed by winds up to a distance of 75 kilometers. An estimated 22 terabacarels of radioactive material, mainly cesium 137 was deposited over a surface of 1,800 square kilometers. Lake Arache actually has its own geographics video. If you're interested in checking that out, please do after. We won't go on much more about it here. As you may imagine, both disasters, plus the continued release of radiation and waste, had lasting effects on the health of Kishtim workers and other local inhabitants. Studies conducted by Dr. Kosenko in the 1990s found that the impacted population had a higher than average incidence of leukemia and solid tumors. About 40% of all leukemia deaths in the area were linked to radiation exposure, and Dr. Kosenko pointed points out that the risk of contracting cancer in the area was comparable to values found in atomic bomb survivors. Additional research by Siberian Medical University found an increase in the frequency of chromosome aberrations in the blood cells of affected locals. Another study by Kosenko ever found that there is no conclusive evidence that these aberrations may have caused mutations in the children born around Kishtim. Anecdotal evidence suggests that the fauna may have mutated in the area, though. Some fishermen in the southern Urals have reported catching fish with no eyes and no fins. Then there is the case of the Kishtim dwarf. In the summer of 1996, a retired Kishtim woman called Tamara Posverina was spotted walking around town with a bundle in her arms, which was apparently a baby. She called him Alexei, or Alyashenka, and fed him milk and cottage cheese. Several residents met Alyashenko, describing him as 25 centimeters tall, humanoid, with brown skin, no hair, and large protruding eyes. Nobody knew where the baby had come from. Tamara was hospitalized due to schizophrenia, and in her absence, nobody took care of the baby. Predictably, he died of neglect. His body was collected by a friend of Tamara, who mummified it. This man was later arrested, and the body of the mysterious Kishtim dwarf was collected by police officer Vladimir Bendlin. The press described Bendlin as the Fox Mulder of the Urals, the first person who tried to make sense of this story while being sober. Bendlin consulted several experts on the origins of the strange body. A pathologist claimed that Alyashenka was not human, while a gynecologist gave a more realistic assessment. The dwarf could have been a baby born with terrible deformations, perhaps due to radiation. Bendlin kept the body in his fridge until he made a mistake. He handed it over to a group of ufologists for their expertise. Unfortunately, the experts vanished into thin air, 
and so did Alyashenka. More recently, the Mayak plant at Kishtim has been the center of another investigation, this time of a more scientific kind. A November 2019 article in the American journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences covers the case of a plume of Ruthenium-106 that was detected across Europe in 2017. The research team, led by Dr. Masson of the French Institute of Nuclear Safety, believed the plume was released following a sizable yet undeclared nuclear accident. The concentrations of the radioactive isotope, while ultimately harmless, were well above the normal average. Wind and weather conditions suggested that the plume came from the southern Urals region, placing the Mayak plant high in the list of suspects. Investigations were conducted by an independent NGO, the French Commission for Independent Research and Information on Radioactivity. Soil samples collected 16 kilometers from the Kishtim site indicated an abnormal presence of ruthenium-106. This piece of evidence was ultimately deemed inconclusive. However, the case reawakens the concerns around the eventuality of nuclear accidents. I'm aware that the topic of nuclear plant safety is certainly controversial. However, I should point out that according to the World Nuclear Association, the evidence over six decades shows that nuclear power is a safe means of generating electricity. On top of that, the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, repeatedly remarks that nuclear power plants are among the safest and most secure facilities in the world. That continues to be mostly true as long as the government involved is not the USSR. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.